Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about my lost decade. This is what I call 1993 to 2003. And I think this is a pretty appropriate thing to talk about after I've talked about my whole work-life balance slash passion thoughts. And some people know this, some people don't, but pretty much from the end of Making Rags to Riches, which came out in 93, to almost the end of Making Temple of Elemental Evil, which came out in 2003, I didn't do anything except work on video games. Many of you may think, okay, he's exaggerating. No. I pretty much worked every weekday, probably for about 10 hours, until we probably, before the team started crunching, I always felt like I can't ask people to crunch, let me try to get some stuff done. So starting about three to six months before I even think about asking anyone to put in extra time, I was working probably 10 to 12 hours a day and Saturday. So by the time crunch came around, I'd be working 12 to 14 hours a day every day. Which meant, I'll talk about what that meant in terms of my life, but what you have to remember is that meant I didn't see any current movies for that entire 10-year period from 93 to 2003. No current movies, no current music, no current TV shows. Um, at Interplay, unless I did something at the Thursday night thing, that that game night I told you about, I didn't do anything. So we might have, someone might have brought in a movie for us to watch or a TV show. I know we watched a lot of Reboot. But if it, if it wasn't there, I didn't watch it at home. I don't even think I had cable for most of that time because why would I have it? I'm not really home to watch it. Once I got to Troy, once I started Troika in 98, nothing. So that means from 98 to 2003 for about five years, nothing. The closest I ever got to socializing was occasionally going out to lunch. But even then I didn't do that every day. And sometimes maybe only once or twice in a month. So let me kind of put in perspective what changed from my point of view. Music. I talk about like the number ones. Music went from Whitney Houston to 50 Cent. In fact, funny story, while we were making Arcanum, Jesse Reynolds, one of the programmers, mentioned Britney Spears. And I, in pure, honest innocence, looked at him and said, is that a new weapon in the game? He just looked at me and said, hey, you need to get out more. He explained to who Britney Spears was. I think we watched uh, one of her videos. Um, God, I'm going to Brita out here. I love community. Hit me with your genie bottle. I forget. It was um, uh, the one where she's dancing around in classrooms. Anyway, movies, the number one movie went from Aladdin in 93 to the final Lord of the Rings movie, Return of the King, in 2003. Huge range. Number one TV show went from being 60 Minutes to CSI. Now, I did play games in that period. I played a lot of games. Um, I would often go home and play... Oh, gosh. I, pretty much most of the RPGs that came out in that time period I played. I liked puzzle games. Um, especially, I'd keep my links... Uh, by in the bedroom nightstand, I'd play like Chips Challenge and stuff. I used to play a game called Sherlock on the PC. Really got hugely into EverQuest as soon as it came out in 98. was into that game hard for three years. I'm talking, I had characters I soloed. I had characters that I played in groups. I told you about some of them. Totally forgot to talk about the Necro Squad, where he made six necromancers that just grouped up. Evan told us it was a mistake to put that many of the same class in one group. But we rocked that game. We would do things way over our level because we just send in pets. If a pet died, five other pets kept it busy until the sixth one, you know, 
made another pet. We went through a lot of bones, but a Necro Squad in original EverQuest was very effective. So I've often had to tell people, you have to imagine what life is like when you're completely and 100% obsessed into your job. So for a big chunk of, I go weeks, and if I was crunching, maybe months on end with never seeing my home in the daylight. I just, I'd, I'd leave when it was dark. I would get home when it was dark. I often, about, you know, once a week, would, as soon as I got home, I'd just start a load of laundry. Then I'd maybe grab something to eat, maybe sit down and watch an episode of Simpsons, something. I would then switch the laundry into the dryer and just pass out and go to sleep. Knowing that in the morning, I could go downstairs and just grab everything clean out of the dryer. And I would do that sometimes for months. I would go shopping. I found a, a grocery store near me that was open 24 hours every day of the week. That was amazing. And I'd go shopping at 2 a.m. Now, if you've ever gone shopping at 2 a.m., you know that it's an interesting collection of people. A lot of high people, a lot of drunk people. And then people like me who are, who people thought I worked a swing shift. Um, but I got to know some of the people who do the grocery because they'd see me there once a week at two in the morning. I, ne I went for months without ever seeing the deli or the butcher shop open because those aren't open 24-7. Um, I believe there was a pharmacy too, always closed. Little coffee pl sh cafe, always closed. My mom came to visit once and I came home and she had this really good fried chicken. I'm like, where'd you get this? She goes, your grocery store. I'm like, they don't sell this. Turns out they did. They sold rotisserie chicken and fried chicken freshly made, but not at two in the morning. In fact, it was so bad towards the end of Fallout in 97 that my neighbors thought I had moved because they literally never saw me. And at night, there wouldn't be lights on in my house. In fact, I ended up, when they told me that, I went, up, went out and bought timers to make my lamps come on in the living room and the bedroom for certain periods in the evening. And of course, when I told them I hadn't moved, it turns out I got the nickname in my neighborhood of the Hermit because people thought, well, he lives there, but we never, ever see him. They, I mean, they never saw me, so I'm not surprised. It was a weird 10-year period. Just recently, I saw an interview with Donald Glover, and it's probably about four years old, but he talked about being raised in a very religious household, and he wasn't allowed to watch television or see movies or listen to the radio or, or most music. And he was on Stephen Colbert, and Colbert asked him, how did this affect you when you got older? And he said, well, when he discovered those things as an adult, they fascinated him in a way that people his age, people in their 20s, weren't fascinated by. They had gotten over all that in their childhood. And I related to that because there were many things when I started living again in 2003 that just amazed me. I mean, I had my first cell phone. I, I probably got a cell phone in the late 90s and just used it for work. That was when you paid a lot for roaming minutes. By 2003, it was what everybody used everything for. People were texting. You could even send pictures, although sometimes you only got a link and you had to go look it up on a browser. It was interesting. It was wild. Um, the world had changed in 10 years. And instead of feeling like I was in my 30s, part of me felt like I was still stuck back in my 20s. What ended this was while finishing up Temple, I should say finishing, last six months, which for me was already crunch time. I was like, this has to end. I can't keep doing this. I'm in my 30s. I, I see that this kind of mode of living can't continue. And I decided to date. I didn't know anybody. <laughs> I hadn't, you know, even been out in the world for 10 years. So I went on Match.com and met an architect who was good looking and funny and smart and we started doing all these things. Uh, 
we went out to eat dinner in really nice restaurants. I went to some charity events with him. I, I have a tux. I had a tux. I ended up um, traveling a lot, which I didn't think I liked. I thought I hated traveling based on basically how I used to travel when I was younger. He knew all the wonderful things about traveling and getting upgrades and using um, lounges at airports and going to really fun places. We went to France. We went to Hawaii. We went to South Korea. It was fun. It was eye-opening. Um, in fact, when Troika shut down, I was in South Korea working on a theme park with that architect when I got a call from Eric DeMilt, who I'd worked with in Interplay. He was the producer on Fallout 2, if I wanted to come to Carbine. So that was interesting. I had to tell him I was in South Korea, and he goes, oh, the home office is there. You should just go by there. And I'm like, no, I'm here working on a theme park. So I look back at all this and I go, was it worth it? You know, do I regret losing those 10 years? No. Was it worth it? I don't know. I do think work-life balance is important. And I guarantee you, I did not have it even before and after that 10-year period. But that 10-year period, no one can argue that my work-life balance was way out of whack. But I also made... Some of my most popular games, the cult classics. And I don't regret those. And I don't want those to not exist. But it was rough coming out of that decade. There are things you're just supposed to know in your 30s that I didn't know. And to this day, I find myself frequently... Still learning things like, especially since I started in the game industry at 16, I never, you know, did standard teenager jobs like work at a retail store or a fast food place. So there's just things I don't know. There's experiences I don't have. And similarly, there are experiences that people have in their 20s and early 30s that I don't have. So there's a disconnect in a bit between me and other people on that. It has gone away as I've gotten older, but I noticed it really the most when I was first coming out of this lost decade. I wouldn't recommend it, but I certainly don't regret it, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So whenever I talk about my lost decade, that's what I'm referring to.